Hello everyone, my name is Silos and I'm very excited to welcome you to the second edition of the PAN podcast. For this episode, our guest is Ronnie Hassan. Ronnie is a registered dietitian and nutritional scientist by craft with many years of work experience in the field of community health promotion. And last year, Ronnie co-founded PAN Israel. Ronnie is not only an incredible professional, but also a very kind person and pleasant conversation partner. So, without further ado, I'm happy to bring to you Ronnie Hassan. Thanks so much for being here with us. Um, so this is our this is our the second edition of our podcast. We've only done one before, and I'm I'm a huge podcast fan. I really love podcasts, and I'm super happy that we have a uh, that we have our own pan podcast now. And I'm very very thankful that that you're here with us, um, and that you agree to to have this conversation conversation and talk to us. So of first course. of all, thank you thank you very very much uh, for being here. Thank you for offering. I'm very excited and happy to be here and talk to you. So this is the first time we're meeting, where even even though we're only meeting via via Zoom, but yes. I think in, in these times it's it's difficult to to do this uh, um, to do this otherwise. Um, and you told me that you have a um, that you're a registered dietitian and you have a master's degree in nutritional sciences. Yes. Um, so obviously nutrition is something that's that's really close to your heart. That's w one of the one of the most uh, important topics in in your at least in your professional life, and it's a very it's it's a topic that's also very close to my heart. And I know that everyone has his or her own story how they how they got there and why nutrition is something that's very interesting to them. And I would be uh, very interested to hear a little bit about how you got um, how you got into this topic and why why this is something that's so important to you. It is taking me a couple of years back, but I always love to tell the story of uh, how I got into uh, nutrition studies. Um, I originally thought of being a food engineering, um, but for some reason I, I didn't go there. there. Um, it was too far from home and I just looked for a similar way, a similar path, a similar uh, occupation. And then I stumbled upon nutrition science and I went to the faculty of a very well-known uh, academy in Israel, which is the Hebrew University. And I really liked the place. I really liked um, the topic. And I, I will have to tell you that all of my life I was fascinated by the human body. I really liked chemistry. I love food and I love people. So I thought it would be a great combination, the human body, people, food, and supporting people to choose healthy uh, way of living. This has become my goal. This is what I do. You've mentioned that I was, I'm a registered dietitian. I, I also practiced a couple of years of a field called health promotion. Mm -hmm. So this is my passion, mm -hmm. working with communities, helping them to choose healthy, and living well that's super interesting to hear like i'm i'm very very fascinated with you with your communal communal work that you just touched on um because i mean what we sometimes forget even though i'm i, I was never that interested in chemistry but i'm also as, as uh, yeah um, as, as a medical student now in, in my last year um i'm also really interested in the human body of course like how, how does it work and uh, what and especially when it comes to nutrition what do we have to feed the body so it, so that it works as, as best as it can. Um, but then you, you touch on the point that you also have to be interested in people. You have to like people. You have to be, you know, if, if you really want to, if you really want to um, help people improve their lives, you have to be able to have a connection with them as well. Maybe that you could tell me a little bit about your experience as a nutritionist in a hospital, because that's, I've never, I've, I've talked to nutritionists before, but I haven't, have, I've never talked to a nutritionist that works, or that, or that had worked in a hospital. So I'd be really interested in, in what this experience was like for you, and um, maybe what, what things you, you saw that could be improved on. This was the beginning of my career. Um, mm. After uh, the degree, we have to practice for uh, six months in a hospital. Uh, like a medical student has to go practice in a hospital. So this is what I did. And this was eye-opening, meeting people in very difficult situations mm -hmm. and um, the willing to help them um, get it through, getting better, being healthy, uh, really touched me. So after this six months, um, this uh, hospital offered me to 
keep working there. And of course, I agreed. Uh, it is a very challenging work, waking up every morning and going to a hospital, meeting people um, in a very difficult situation. But it is very rewarding to meet them, to listen to them, to um, fix them with the best food that will make them feel better and be healthier. Mm. And I learned a lot there, maybe even more from three years of a nutrition degree. Mm. I mean, practice is, is something that I really um, into it. I really like um, getting things very down to earth, very practical. Mm. So meeting people and seeing them getting better and very thankful for the treatment they got. Uh, it, was, it was a great job. It was a great experience. I, I think I learned a lot. There. Working with people, learning how to motivate people. Mm. This is something that I really, really liked. So uh, after a year and a four months working in this hospital, I uh, got this opportunity to work, uh, and this is the next step you've mentioned, in communities. Yeah, yeah. So this, this was the hospital phase, and uh, then I, I realized I really like working with people and motivating them to choose healthy food. So this was my next step. Mm -hmm. So the, I'm, I'm thinking about the working situation. Like, did, did you work together with the medical doctors? Did you work together with, with the other s staff, or were you kind of let alone with your, with your nutrition stuff. So let the nutritionist do whatever, whatever she wants to do and we just do our, our medical work. Was there a, a good collaboration between all the different, all the different uh, professionals at the hospital or yeah. how, 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 did that, how, was that, how was that situation for you? It's a very interesting question, a very complicated answer. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends. Some of the uh, physicians and other staff members uh, were into teamwork. I'm, I'm a person of teamwork. I believe in uh, joint forces. I, I really, uh, this is one of the things that I try to do uh, till today. Working in multidisciplinary uh, to help people get better and live well. I think the input of each uh, profession is a, a, makes a whole treatment mm. and makes a better treatment. So I felt that, that uh, sometimes we do things together, we do things in sync, um, and sometimes because of the very stressful place and situation where the medical uh, staff is at and, and, of course, the patients, sometimes we couldn't do it together. Mm -hmm. uh, we did try, um, and when we did so, I felt like it's a, a, a lot more helpful. So it depends on the person you work with. Sometimes people... Like, did I understand that correctly? Sometimes people enjoy working as a team, also in the hospital, and you, you, maybe you, you um, had some medical doctors that you, could, you, you went along with well, and maybe some others don't enjoy, and don't enjoy doing this so much? Now I'm getting to a, um, an interesting issue, because, a topic, because some of the medical doctors are more into nutrition and the fact that it builds our body and allows us to uh, live healthily, mm -hmm. and some uh, give it less importance. Okay. So it is also um, this issue of whether it's important um, or not and teamwork or not. So it's, it's two different uh, aspects. What, what we're trying to do with PAN, right, is trying to get medical students and medical doctors more up to date when it comes to nutritional sciences because there is so much science showing us that we can improve people's health vastly um, by changing their nutrition. But it's just so little known in, in the medical world. Um, and I think that's really something that we, I mean, it's, it's a shame, but we're working on it. I, I guess that's, that's what we really, um, that what's, what's we're, what we're really here for as PAN. I think that relying on science and articles and the knowledge we already have on nutrition, and we have a vast uh, field of knowledge in nutrition. And this, this reminds me that I, I also try to do it when I worked in the hospital, to bring the uh, most uh, updated data that shows that nutrition is powerful, influential, and I think this is a good way to talk among um, uh, professionals in, mm -hmm. in, in medicine field. Mm -hmm. So it has a crucial role in, in this um, communication between dietitians and physicians, and I, I think it's a very big, a very big um, issue that we're trying to do in PAN in Israel and PAN yeah. International.
Yeah, I had some conversations with with um, medical doctors, also pro um, professors at our university, who are always very critical about nutritional research because there are less randomized controlled trials, right? I mean, it's just, um, and I think we, we really have to get together. Nutritionists and medical doctors have to work together in order to understand that the basis of the scientific work is different. Like you cannot, a pharmaceutical a drug can be tested very easily in a randomized controlled trial, yeah. but you cannot test the dietary pattern yeah. in a randomized controlled trial. It's just impossible. Like it's, 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 it's biologically, it's physically, it's just in our reality, it's impossible to do that. So we have to accept this. And I think we have to understand that nutritional science is not worth any less. It's just a different approach to scientific research. I, I think it's crucial that we understand the difference between examining um, uh, a pill mm. or a medicine mm. and eating habits. It's completely different. You can't uh, take one part and examine it in nutrition. Almost, you, you cannot almost do that. Um, and and LCTs are great for medication, but it's, it's very complicated in nutrition. There are very less uh, articles uh, in randomized controlled trials in nutrition. And it's one of the first things I said in, I say in my, web, my webinar, that nutrition is a different field. We use science the same way as medicine, but we do look at the epidemiological data. We can learn from it. I'm, I'm not saying it's the same as RCTs, but the combination of RCTs mm -hmm. and epidemiological um, articles um, can give us a good picture. Yeah, and it's really cool that we're getting together. Like, I, I feel that this this conversation we're having right now is one of those conversations that should be taking place much more often. Where, yeah, where these two professions just get together and and exchange their opinions and exchange also exchange the way that everything is presented to them because things are presented to, to physicians and to nutritionists in a different way. Um, and I think this is um, this is important to understand. Um, Maybe also time-wise. I don't know how much how much time you have in a hospital as a as a nutritionist when you talk to people. Like, but as as a physician, you always have very limited time. And I guess it's similar to nutritionists. But I can, I can imagine that maybe you have twenty or thirty minutes to 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 talk to someone and to to really try to you know influence their behavior um, as well. But as a physician, most of the time you have you have very at least in, in Germany uh, you have very limited limited time maybe to, to talk to people for five or 10 minutes and you really want to try to get the crucial medical information across? I think physicians have fewer minutes with the patient than nutritionists or dietitians. Um, and it is an unfortunate situation which we have to address and think about. And we do our best to do with the little time we have. I think dietitians have a little more time with the patient and this this allows us to talk about the eating patterns and ask more questions and I, I, I understand physicians that they have limited time also in their in their studies in the years of the Academy and then in practice so um, but I would have to say maybe I'm uh, going a little forward but I hear today from physicians and medical students that they are willing and anxious to know more about nutrition. Yeah. They're so prepared, they're so ready, they're so into it. They're themselves saying, we should learn this more. So I'm very, very optimistic because of that. I mean, everyone who studies medicine is interested in, in health and everyone who, st who starts studying is interested in maybe also being healthy themselves. Other people might only be interested in making others healthy, which is totally fine as well. But I think the majority of medical students um, are interested in being healthy themselves and they, they try to feel good. Um, and when you look like when you, when you take a, uh, when you, when, when you take a class of medical students, usually they have a very good BMI. Usually they do sports, very few people smoke. So they're very health oriented. And um, now there are so many myths about nutrition. And also as a medical student, when you're not prepared to read, read nutritional sciences, for example, you, you just don't really know what's going on. Like you have to rely on outer sources. You have to rely on maybe articles that you read on the internet. And as, as we all know, you can read anything and everything on the internet. <laughs> you, you never know how valid the information is. So I think what you touched on a couple of minutes ago, understanding scientific research it's crucial. We, we, have to, we have to be able to understand this. And then an organization like PAN, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, why all of the PAN branches are now being formed. 
um, I think we need a strong alliance where people say, hey, we need evidence-based nutrition. And, and we need this in the medical field. There, of course, there are li missing links. We don't know everything. And we will never know everything, I guess. But there is, like we, as, as you said, there is a lot of information and we can use this. And honestly, most of the information isn't that controversial. Yes, there are controversial topics, but the basis is pretty clear. I think that you've um, touched in, in a very important um, part that PAN, uh, I, as I see PAN is doing, it's taking the data that is there and uh, making it accessible for physicians. Because these days there, there's a gap between the amount of information and the way uh, physicians consume it. Uh, you've mentioned um, journalists or, or like uh, websites or mm. where do we get our knowledge from? Yeah. It's a big issue because um, I'm trying to be delicate a lot of the information online is inaccurate or um, it's, it's uh, of course, it's not scientific. So taking the scientific evidence and uh, translating it to an uh, easy way to consume it, to read it, to hear it, to listen to it, to watch it, I think it's a big part that we're playing. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important one because when the knowledge is there and you can get it, I believe it's going to change how we act, how we do things in a good way, of course. You told me that you're doing, that you did the, the communal, or that you're doing communal work. Um, for example, with a program, maybe we can talk about this as well, the program Henry. Um, yeah. I think it's, you, it's a health exercise and nutrition for the really young. Yes. Uh, you told me about this. So when you change people's behavior towards healthier behaviors, you can try to change you can try behavioral change, like you can try to make them behave differently in the same environment, or you can try to change their environment. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the communal work that you're doing and how you influence, maybe influence both behavioral change and also environmental change so, so that it's easier for people to, um, to follow the, the, healthy, the, health, the healthy choices. Well, maybe this is the reason why I really liked the last webinar uh, with Dr. Mm. Benjamin uh, Gardner. Um, it, it's, it's a topic that fascinates me, how to help people change behaviors. And you've mentioned two, um, two ways to do so. So I think one of the key parts of health promotion, which I uh, did for 14 years, also in the program that you've mentioned, a British program called Henry, um, I think the title of health promotion is to make the healthy choice easiest. Mm -hmm. How do we form our environment in a way that when we reach our hands, it's going to be fruit over there or a glass of water and not something different, not sodas and not snacks, etc. Mm -hmm. So in this uh, training that I got in this program, which involves uh, parenting skills, and healthy lifestyle in uh, childhood. I believe I got amazing tools and skills how to work in partnership. This is the key role, the key uh, subject of this program is how to be uh, in a partnership model and not in an expert model. It's, mm -hmm. I love this idea of working together to find out how it is more comfortable for you, more feasible for you to make the changes you see fit. Mm -hmm. Meaning if um, a parent is choosing to change, for example, eating more vegetables in his, in his family, we're gonna find out together the way that is suitable for him to do so. If you don't just drop information and suggestions to the patient, mm -hmm. then it's more likely that he's gonna succeed in this change. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, working both ways as you've mentioned before trying to change the environment if even if the environment is your own home what you buy what you have in the house mm. and changing behavior because um one uh, one thing in, in this program was saying if you want to stop doing something find out another thing you're going to do instead not just eliminating but substituting it for something healthy so it's not you don't just feel a lack of this thing you're going to see what else you're going to gain from this change. Um, so this is one of the tricks that we, we used. A lot, a lot more tricks. But um, One more thing I really uh, liked and I think I purchased in this program is um, 
skills of what you've mentioned earlier, how to run a community, how to um, communicate, mm -hmm. um, how to listen, how to um, ask questions. Asking the right questions sometimes leads to the most important information. It's basic communication and we sometimes forget to do so. Uh, so last thing about this program is that it also involves working the professionals with the parents, the way they're working with in a partnership model, as I've mentioned, and parents with children, because it's alike. It's like getting engaged as a family. So this is a lot of things that I feel like I've purchased working in this program, that the, it's a skill that I um, luckily can do these days in a pan as well. The fact that you can that you can change your home environment, that that's already an environmental change. That's really, that's really interesting because usually when I think of environmental change, I think of, we have to change grocery stores. Like we, <laughs> we have to make, uh, we have to make the healthy choice. As, as you said, the, the healthy choice, the easiest choice or the easier choice. Mm -hmm. um, I always think about big changes. Like, I don't know whether that's the same in Israel, but when you go to a, uh, when, when you check, when you go to the checkout to the cashier in a grocery store in Germany, like all the sweets, Yeah. Are right in the children in children's eyesight, right? So that's something where I go like, okay, there should be apples and oranges and bananas and <laughs> yes, and, and maybe also some vegetables. So it'd be great if children were were always exposed to this. So I'm thinking about these things. But what you're mentioning is very feasible, like changing your home environment, not having a Coca Cola at home, but maybe having only having water at home, or maybe having some. Yeah, I don't know, maybe having a bowl of fruit on your table instead of a, br um, a bowl of candy. Yeah. So these are also environmental changes mm -hmm. that make it much more easier in, to change your habits. I mean, when you only have this environment at home, you're ha I think I listened to um, a podcast with Dan Buettner, the, the, the guy who yes. founded the, the Blue Zones. Blue Zones. Yeah. He told, he, I think he talked about this as well, that he tries to have his home as 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 health proof as as possible you know to ju <laughs> just just not have any un un unhealthy foods at home and then when you go and eat outside it's not a problem if you have something if you have something maybe in quote unquote unhealthy uh, maybe once a week if you're eating healthfully the rest of the time um, everything's going to be fine also other topics serious just like uh, an example that just came into my head If you, you choose if you put a television in the bedroom or not, mm. this is making the environment you wish to live in. So if we, we do watch too many, uh, I don't know, television, computers, cell phone, we, we have all these kinds of um, screens, mm. screen time, we call it screen time. In yeah, yeah. So if it's not in the bedroom, maybe it will help us watch it less. So it's also how you uh, arrange the house, Of course, what you buy to, to eat and drink, but a, a lot, any other subjects are included, uh, physical activity, for example. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 conc I, uh, I think of a house as a micro environment uh, mm. for the family, yes. Mm. You actually have power to change that. You yeah. don't have power to change the grocery store, but this is something, like I'm always looking for a, a mindset of how you can empower yourself Because if you're looking, I mean, you, you can try to look for information outside of yourself, but I think empowerment, you can, like the, the, the power to change your life, it has to come from within. Uh, you can have motivation from other people, but you really have to, you know, have to be your own resource uh, in, order to, in order to really sustain healthy living, for example, or in order to sustain happy living. That's what it's, what it's about in the end, I guess. Yeah, and this program was not only uh, health habits. It's wellness. It's also the cooperation between parents and children. If we do things together, if we don't argue, if we um, communicate in a different way, in, a, in an emotional way, and ju not just giving orders, it was a very big emphasis in this program. So if you ask a parent, what would you like to do better or to do different? then I think all the mechanism, all the uh, defenses go down because you ask him, what would you like to do? Um, I can just give a small example that maybe will um, illuminate. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Stop it. Um, it. It's a very uh, easy example because we talked about um, allowing um, choice to a child. It's not too much, cho too much choice, not having no choice, but guided choice, not asking 
what would you like to eat? Like a very big, open, frightening question. Mm -hmm. And not, you have uh, beans, this is what we eat. But asking two different uh, mm -hmm. um, suggestions. Mm -hmm. Would you like to have an apple or would you like to have a carrot? For example, if, if you're what, if the, this is what you choose your children to eat. Mm -hmm. So the child have, uh, um, can choose. So one parent, when we talked about this topic uh, one week, the next week when we came back, we asked, how did things go this week? And one parent said, I went home and thought about this tool. And the next time my child had to put on his sandals so we can go to the park, and he really likes hating, uh, he, he really hates put, putting his sandals. Yeah. I asked him, honey, would you like to put your sandals in the living room or in your room? Mm -hmm. He grabbed up his sandals, ran to the living room and put, up, put them on. Mm -hmm. Because the parent framed uh, the action and asked where you want to do it. So she said it was like magic mm -hmm. sometimes little uh little things can make a big difference that's a really cool story i'm, I'm while you were talking i was thinking this is uh, giving people freedom of choice that's something that's inertly human like we we, we <laughs> want to be able to choose we we don't want yeah we, we don't want like an like a or some, or some well i guess i guess i guess it's easier for in behavioral change to give people an easy an easy choice like you want a carrot or you want an apple or the the example with the sandals you gave and i'm and i'm thinking how can you um how can we reframe this for a hospital setting for example like as a medical doctor when you go to a patient and you see okay this patient is somehow unhealthy maybe the patient has a metabolic syndrome for example maybe the mm -hmm. patient is a smoker and might also be overweight and and has high blood pressure and all you know unhealthy unhealthy lifestyle in instead of telling them what to do you can also ask the question what would you like i mean that's a great question what would you like to change and then this person might be much much more open to cha also change other other aspects of his or her life and you have one one subject already where you can actually work with people where, where you know there is a motivation people would like to change and then you can move them in the right direction you can tell them oh, okay you want to change your your diet that's awesome i can send you to a nutritionist for example or maybe this person has has listened to a pan to a pan webinar and and then then uh, the doctor might be able to give advice Uh, him or herself. I, I think it's it's the inner motivation that is very helpful in this situation. Mm -hmm. And asking questions, maybe the patient didn't come with this inner motivation, but asking questions, maybe raise it to his awareness that mm -hmm. he starts thinking about it. And then maybe at this moment, but maybe going home and thinking about it, what would you like to change? What would you like to do differently? Maybe you would like to think about your eating habits. Because sometimes we have so many things to change that we want to change or need to change. Maybe starting with the thing that the, the person wants to do. And if you ask him, you can get this information. And then you can start from there. And then he feels a success and he wants to go further. So a bit of, it's, it's called motivational interviewing. Yeah. And, and <laughs> we have lots of other theories I relate to it. So it's, it's a lot of the things that fortunately I stepped upon on my professional way. Mm -hmm. And I uh, try using them also these days in, uh, in Pan Israel. You, you can put off people so easily by telling them what to do. Sometimes people enjoy it if you, if you take away a decision that they, they, they would have to make. But you have to be able to feel this. You have to be able to realize, okay, when, uh, when, is, there, when is there an openness for a directive for a directive approach and when is there not and when do you when do you have to be very um yeah open and when do you have to ask open questions and let, let the people decide themselves basically yeah. Um, yeah which is sometimes hard for us because i think in health as health professionals we're always inclined to have a solution i like to tell people wh what to do basically uh which um yeah might sometimes um be be the not the most successful approach <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, i have a suggestion if i may yeah sure uh, yeah, yeah of course try, try to think uh, and feel how do you feel when someone starts a sentence with you must or you should mm. it's like it, it gets me back to the freedom of choice that you mentioned before because if someone tells you you have to change x y etc it's very stressful 
pain. It's, it's not going to the part where you want to um, um, cooperate with, with this kind of advice. It takes us a few levels up in, in, this, in this field that we're working in helping people choose healthier habits. I'm also super interested in that. Maybe we can, we can, we can, uh, we can meet again for another podcast <laughs> we could, where we can only talk about uh, motivational interviewing or, or different techniques on, on how to change people's behavior. There's one more thing I wanted to ask that, that I wrote down. Um, in, this, in, the, in the program, Henry, that, that we touched on, so the, the, the health, health and exercise, health exercise for, very, and for the very young. For and the nutrition for the very young. Yeah. And nutrition for the very young. What role did nutrition play within, this, within the program? Um, and how, how well do people receive um, the nutritional information for, in comparison to the exercise information, for example? Is there a difference? I, I felt like parents are very eager to learn about nutrition and eating healthy. And a big emphasis in the program was the eating habits, not only what we eat, but how we eat. So if we eat it in front of the television, if we eat it sitting down, if we eat together, as a family, this was a very big issue, um, a family meal, which allows us to communicate and, and, and be a role model for the children. So what we do influences a lot on the children. So we don't have to talk about how healthy it is. We just have to eat it and the kids were going to follow. Um, so one issue is what we eat. And it was very, very simple, very down to earth. What we put on our plates, very simple messages like how vegetables uh, are good to incorporate on, on the plate and, and about water, of course, uh, fruit, etc. cetera. Um, maybe some cooking tips, like um, cooking at home is much better than buying uh, processed or ultra processed foods. Um, and it's most of the times is also cheaper, at least here in Israel. I, I think it's not always the case but uh, buying products and cooking by yourself is still mostly uh, cheaper than buying uh, uh, food that al is already uh, is ready to eat food. So you asked about physical activity. It was, we called it active play because we were talking about early ages mm -hmm. and we talked about examples of how we do so. And actually I didn't mention something really important. We, uh, we learned everything from experience. It was very, very um, engaging uh, workshop. It was no lecture. It was just feeling how we feel with things and then um, realizing how it's going to feel uh, to, the, to the parents that we, uh, we support or to children that we raise. Just, just an example of, of one thing we mentioned earlier, that, like the freedom of choice. Before we were talking about guided choice, like giving two options, um, we asked the participants if they can remember on a, um, some uh, situation that they had no choice and how they felt about it mm. and who wants to share. Mm. And people immediately say, when I had this situation and I couldn't influence anything, I was helpless, it was awful, etc. And you just remember how awful it is when you can't choose. Mm. So it connects us to the uh, to the tool that we give our children choice or are all the parents that we support uh, as I said there was a linkage between professional and parent and then parent and child giving people simple choices makes everything feel so I mean exactly as you said I mean when, when you were just talking about this I thought of a situation where I had no choice and it just feels automatically you feel stuck you 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 yeah. You, you don't know what to do. You feel, you feel um, yeah, it, it's, it's a very unpleasant feeling. And out of this very unpleasant feeling, it's super difficult to, um, to then later on maybe have a good relationship also to the specific topic. Like when you always have to eat something that you don't want to eat, for example, it's likely that you might have a difficult situation when it comes to food. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I guess, yeah, I guess if you have that, if you have that freedom of choice, if you can, if you can choose, if, even if it's just for children, these little choices, um, it makes everything so much more enjoyable. Yeah. Ronnie, if, uh, th thanks so much about the, the information concerning the communal work. I really, I think that's really, um, to, to me at least, it's very interesting that you were able to take so much um, f from that with you, um, from, from working with people and from understanding how people, how we can help people, support people in the best way possible. Um, 
and you told me that you can now take these these experiences that you made with you to to pan to the work that you're doing at pan yeah. so maybe you could tell me a little bit um about how you got involved with with pan and how everything came about because i, I got involved with, with pan international quite early and then i was working for for pan f for a year and then i went back to university and then i just i i worked for pan much less and within the time where i started working less all of a sudden we had different pan branches and we also had pan israel and i thought okay how how did this how did this come along i know that 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 uh, there's a, everyone at pan puts a lot of work into what they're doing but but still i was i was incredibly like like very happy about this but at the same time surprised that everything went so quickly so maybe you could tell me a little bit about how this came along how you got involved and and how pan israel um, got started with pleasure um I'm very excited about this branch that we've created together. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of months ago, when um, Pan International approached um, a colleague of mine, which, which knows me, uh, and said, we're going um, we're gonna to do this. We're going to set up a branch in Israel. And who do you know that is going to be fit for the, for the job? So this colleague of mine, which I know her for a couple of years, and she called me and said, let's meet. Mm -hmm. And she introduced me to this uh, organization and uh, the vision of leading it in, is leading it in Israel. And um, my first response was fear. <laughs> and um, it's, it's a big, big um, mission. Yeah and it requires a lot and it's frightening etc and i i declined very uh, I, I was not um how would they say that i was ambivalent about it okay i i said no but i was i, I was going home and said wow this is such an opportunity to lead something so big and so meaningful and it is much required so I think it took a couple of days for me to say, okay, I can do it. We should do it. It's time. And it's, it's, it's a big mission, but um, we're going we're gonna to make it. And if we have the right people, and I said before, I, I'm a great believer of teamwork, and we have great people that we're doing this team effort and we've established this organization uh, with all the process, uh, the administry uh, included, which is not simple, mm -hmm. but uh, necessary. <laughs> and I think I, I feel that the international organization is, is a big back for us. It's, um, it's professional, it's supportive, and my communication with, um, with the managers of Pan International, um, it felt like um, a good way, a good path, um, and the very right action to do. So it, it wasn't easy to start, and, but I started reaching out to people that I thought would love to take uh, part and support, and, and it started rolling. Um, so we're officially, uh, we got the stamp, uh, at, uh, late March, the end of okay. March. Okay. So more than six months now. More than yeah. six months. Oh, that's, that's great. Uh, that's, that's so cool to hear. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's basically a grassroots movement, right? I mean, when we, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of Pan International, so I know what you're, what you're talking about with all this, um, with all the the, the uh, administrational things that you have to go through, um, uh, yeah, I, I know that our our executive director Mark Hofmann, he's he, he got really into this. He's he's very professional about this, and um, he got the ball rolling with all these administrational things, and he put so much work into this. So I know, I'm I'm at the, how can I put this? I'm I'm so happy for you that everything went fine with the administrational part as well, because this can really be um, something that slows you down. If people don't yeah. want to, don't want to, um, yeah. If people just, if, if the, <laughs> if the organizational part is so draining, that all of a sudden you don't really have the power to do all the all the work that you really would like to do. I mean, basically you want to, 
and talk to people about healthy nutrition. And then before <laughs> you can do that, before you can officially do this. I'm yeah. so excited about it. I, I mean, the beginning, the, the ministry is, is, is drainful and, and tiring, but it's worth every minute. It's, yeah. the, the starting is, is like climbing a mountain. But mm -hmm. when you get to the top and you start working the meaningful work, um, it's, it's just um, so fulfilling. Yeah, I always think about this when, when I think about situations like this. I have a picture in my mind when, when, uh, going back to chemistry that uh, we talked about right at the beginning. <laughs> when you have like when you have to put um, uh, when you have to put energy into a reaction so that the reaction can then can then follow, and then maybe you have an enzyme that makes it a little bit easier. That you know <laughs> exactly <laughs> is, what I was is, thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's Activ always a activation energy. Exactly, that, activation. That's what it's called. So yeah, for all so. the for all the chemical uh, all the chemics nerds out there, this is like <laughs> activation. When you want to get pan rolling, you have to you have to have activation energy like in a chemical in a chemical reaction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then you have a lot of energy to do other stuff. So it's it's really worth it. I recommend it. <laughs> and as you said, I mean that's that's something that uh, that um, I also had the uh, experience with Pan International. It's just once you start, you meet so many wonderful people that want to go along that that are that are interested in this um and that are super passionate about this um and it's so fulfilling uh, to, yeah. to have to have people in in uh, I, I mean for me personally to have people in my life um that are interested in this and the topic first of all yeah that's one thing and then uh, but the, the passion is the other thing and i think there are many people who are very passionate about nutrition um and who are very passionate about making people's lives better and, and, and helping people to become healthier. Meeting people, physicians, dietitians, that we do things together, we lead the way together. And everybody is saying it's about time we do so. And people finding that we have a lot of a lot more of other people that feel the same. That it's time that we join forces, that we join knowledge and skills and support people in choosing uh, healthful uh, eating healthful choices mm -hmm. for the wellness um, so it's it's like bringing people together this is the community part that I've mentioned earlier mm -hmm. and I, I feel like that people are very excited to uh, learn that there are a lot more other people out there that feel the same mm -hmm. that uh, if we do things together like um, um, collaborate uh, nutrition and medicine together we can reach a lot far than we already do. Uh, if, if nutrition is a big part of the medical support physicians give to their patients, we can live a, a lot more healthy. So this is the thing that I like about um, the teamwork that we've said before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, so for people listening, if you, if you want to build a pan branch, you're very, very, we're very, very excited if you would like to do so, and we're very happy to support you. And there might be a pan branch in, in, uh, in your country already. <laughs> so go, go ahead and check and check out pan-in.org and you can see whether, where you can connect with people. Because that's something, I guess, that's, I, I've, for a long time, I felt a little bit left alone when I was really interested in nutrition. When I got interested in nutrition, I thought that I was like, uh, I was either preaching to the choir, you know, only telling people who already knew about this and who, you know, that felt good. But then at the, at the, at the, on the other hand, there were always people who, who, would, who were saying, you know, it, it can't be that easy. Uh, a plant-based diet isn't healthy. You know, they sort of di didn't believe me because I was, I was there as sort of the only person that they had ever heard this from. But now with, with, with Penn, um, I think all over the, all over the world now, we have situations where people can connect. And I think that's really the connectivity of Penn. Um, I think is yeah. really something that makes it very special uh, where people can get together in a professional uh, surrounding where we can have conversations about different scientific points of view. Um, but we also understand the, the importance of, um, yeah, moving forward together and not moving into different separate directions. And that's what I'd love to talk to you about as well. What, what exactly you're doing with Pan Israel, what, what kind of actions you're, you're actually implementing, because this is so cool about Pan as well. Then you have, you have diff in, in these different countries, in the different pan branches, according to the circumstances that you have in your country, you can do different things. You, yeah. it's, it's not like a, a world plan that everybody has to, has to do. It's just everyone can do it the way that they, of course, in a similar fashion, 
and on, on a on a on a, a firm sort of in a, with a firm background but um, then you can you can you can tweak it individually and you can see what works in your country but we could talk a little bit about about what pan Israel is doing at the moment uh, with pleasure um, so I think the the title is um, spreading information making the information accessible for uh, professionals uh, physicians dietitians etc that want to get this information uh, medical students also included they're a very big uh, um, I, I wouldn't say client but um, mm. uh, people who want to get this information so every channels that we can do so like using our website that we keep growing and growing and uh, enriching with more and more information updated data and uh, I'm, I'm very proud to say that now it's it's looking very good um, very rich with the information mm -hmm. so we uh, website is one channel um, newsletter every month we send a newsletter what we've done what we've learned what's gonna be maybe some uh, international webinar that we recommend and we do recommend them um, and um, and the other is um, like um, it's a mailing sequence that everyone that is registered uh, gets a, a tiny um, uh, piece of information every week. We mm. call it knowledge bites. It's like yeah, small bites of knowledge and you get it every week. Maybe it's a, a new article. Uh, what about the myth of uh, eating fruits uh, and uh, preventing diabetes? Mm. Is it recommended? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you in a secret, yes. Um, so it's like small knowledge bites. Yeah. And of course, a webinar that you've mentioned. Um, in the last couple of months, unfortunately, uh, we're not as able to go on the field as we would like to. Yeah. So webinar is a very good challenge, uh, channel. So uh, we have, um, till now we had one webinar that I gave every two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an ongoing, like every two weeks, it's, it's new audience, it's people who register on our website and come and listen to the webinar. It's, it's amazing, uh, people, the feedbacks, and after almost each webinar, I get a phone call or an email or both from a physician or a medical student or a dietitian on how illuminating it was, mm -hmm. how... Um, it's lovely to see that information uh, out there accessible and I want to join you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the best, the best sentence uh, I can hear. Um, so this is one thing is, is spreading information is making inf uh, data accessible. Uh, and the other, as we talked before, getting together. As, as an organization, as a movement, as a community. So um, all of our supporters that um, professionals that say we're into it, we want to be involved, we want to help, we want to be informed, you can rely on us. So we create uh, a community of supporters and we use different channels uh, to communicate. We have a closed Facebook group mm -hmm. and we share information and we um, uh, talk about um, strategy or maybe um, making new collaborations etc mm -hmm. and we have a whatsapp group and mm -hmm. we can communicate okay. over there yeah um, we uh, we try not to nag on it because it might be there a lot uh, a little uh, tiring mm -hmm. and this is regarding the community and we also have meetings like every couple of months we meet and uh, catch up and think together mm -hmm. and consult etc sounds great yeah i really i really enjoy the uh, i really like the idea of these recurring webinars that you're doing that's really cool because what i mean what we with what we've been doing with panish and national is we all i mean we now we have these we have these two webinar series one of them for for the university groups or it started, it's called ISTA, so eat it, basically. <laughs> um, started by the university group, which is a really big success. And then we have another English speaking, what, what you touched on this when you talked about Benjamin Gardner's talk, for example, which I also found 
incredibly good. I, I mean, if, if anyone's interested, check out Benjamin Garden, Dr. Benjamin Gardner's work. He, he was a very, very, I mean, very likable person, very enjoyable to listen to him. Um, and I think his work is super important. So um, yeah, a big, big shout out to, to Dr. Benjamin yeah. Gardner and thanks, thanks again. Um, so, but what, what you were saying, I really find this interesting to do these recurring webinars uh, every two weeks yeah. because then people know, okay, um, I like the last one and then I don't have to wait for, for months and months for, for the next webinar, but th this, this, this wonderful person that, that, had, that, held that, that held that webinar, she will be there in two, month, two weeks again and so it's a, it's a, um, yeah, it's like a, it's almost like a, like a really, really, really good online course that you can do. Um, it's actually the same. It's the same webinar each time for uh, new listeners. Okay. Time. Okay. I see. I see. Yeah. But you just reminded me that uh, we just started um, another course of webinars. Yeah. Okay. It's physicians that support the organization. Yeah, okay. And each time we have a different uh, speaker. So we already had one. Uh, Dr. Miriam Meisel, and she gave uh, one webinar, and uh, actually uh, it was very popular. Uh, about 30 people uh, joined the webinar. Mm -hmm. in, in in Israel terms, it's it's a good uh, it's a good audience. Good to know, yeah. And we also have another one upcoming uh, in December. A different. Uh, she's a pediatrician, and she's a great supporter of the organization. One of the founders, actually, Dr. Tzvi yeah. Shifer Harubi. Mm -hmm. And she's going to give the next uh, webinar. So we have the regular one that I give. Okay. And uh, we're, we're trying to, um, to create more. That's great. Yeah, yeah I saw some. That, that, that's, that's great to hear. I saw some videos on your website. Unfortunately, I cannot read or under, understand <laughs> Hebrew. But I checked out your website. And first I thought, okay, I don't understand anything. But then I just clicked on every, on, <laughs> on every button that I could click on. <laughs> and just sort of clicked my way through. And, and then I found those videos. And I thought they were awesome. I, I mean, I only understood what studies you were using. And I was able to understand the slides. Um, but I thought that was really, I mean, a great resource. Someone who wants to get started with this. If someone watches through, watches through these videos, then you're you're super well equipped, and I think it's even even better <laughs> when you're able to read and understand what's what's on there. But yeah, I thought the 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 resource aspect by itself was already great. Yeah, I I, I strongly believe that resources are a great tool, and whoever wants to learn more about this field has a very good address to go to our website our website. And for some reason, uh, what, what you said uh, reminded me that I, I, I missed a very key um, part of our um, actions. One of the things that I uh, really try to lead in our organization is collaborations with uh, policymakers. You've mentioned earlier the grocery store versus home. So mm -hmm. if we can influence the grocery stores, it, it might be a great, be great uh, yeah. path. So. Mm -hmm. I, th I believe, uh, I, again, in, in collaborations, in partnerships, and I'm reaching out to uh, important organizations in Israel and trying to find out what we can do together. Um, I'm in touch with um, very influential uh, organizations, and I, I can give one example. Mm -hmm. um, in June this year, um, we've... Um, had the nutrition week, nutrition and nutritionist week in Israel. Mm -hmm. Like talking about how nutrition is important and what is the dietitian's work. Mm -hmm. And during this week, we've sent, um, it's a letter to physicians uh, signed by five very important organizations in Israel. One of them is Pan Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is the Ministry of Health. Mm. Uh, the next one is the um, dietitian's organization in Israel called Amutat Atid. Mm -hmm. um, the next is um, the company of uh, clinical nutrition. Mm -hmm. And the last one is the medical association in Israel. So five of these organizations wrote a letter to physicians. Dear physicians, we suggest you include nutrition in your day-to-day -day work with your patients. Mm know the dietary guidelines, get familiar with them, the Mediterranean diet that we have adopted in Israel, mm -hmm. and refer to dietitians when, when it's necessary, when, when you feel it's going to um, support your patient. So um, this is 
is, is a paper addressing physicians and uh, we wrote it with these four other organizations. It's just an example when I think collaborations might grow very interesting things. Um, I have, we have more uh, other things that we try to do, like addressing other organizations and finding out, um, I will not tell about it now because it didn't happen yet, so I'm, I'm okay. not uh, saying who, yeah. um, but trying to um, put this on the map and figuring out uh, what we would like to advance, what they would like to advance, finding the common ground and going uh, together to projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that's really, that's, I mean, first of all, I mean, the collaboration aspect again, I think is crucial. We, we have to, uh, we have to come together and we have to understand that even though we, all these, I mean, the organizations that you mentioned, I, I guess they have differences, you know, they are, they see things differently. And that's the same in Germany. As, as far as I understand, that's the same in, in the United States, for example, as well. Of course, every organization has their different interests, but there is common ground and we have to come together on this common ground. If, if we're looking at the problems that we're facing nationally and you know there's a world map be right behind me nationally in every country but also globally they're just massive massive problems that we have to work with and and they're the problems of our generation i think we can only come together and work with a common ground and then if we if we solve the issues that we can solve on on the basis of this common ground then we can still talk about these small differences that we have um, with, for example, within the within medical professionals, um, but yeah, I, I really, I really, for, I mean, it's incredible that you have the um, that you have the Medical Association of Israel uh, on board, which I think is that, that's, I mean, that's awesome. Yeah, that's the, I mean, it can't, it can't get any better than that when when you want to address physicians. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and in in this topic, I would like to mention a sentence that is in my mind and heart all the time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned. Uh, global, international, national efforts, uh, a sentence that I really like, um, which expresses my beliefs. If you want to go far, uh, sorry, if, you're go if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. So joining together with other organizations can get us further. Um, my dream is to get um, together with the academy, mm -hmm. with the medical um, academies, uh, schools, the medical schools, mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that if we get there, if we incorporate nutrition um, courses in med school, it's going to be a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think med students are uh, very thirsty for this information, and it's going to put us on the map, the nutrition topic, uh, and dietitians also. Uh, because uh, we're the experts for this topic, but uh, physicians have a key role, uh, referring patients, addressing patients with this topic. So I believe everyone will be beneficial by it. The professionals, the patients, the nation mm -hmm. are going to be healthier. So this is where I strive for. Yeah. Do you know the, about the, um, the ISTAS webinar series, the, what's called, or if you translate it, it's Eat, Eat This? It's it's the it's what we're doing at the universities um, at the moment. Um, so we we're having weekly webinars, um, and we have external um, external professors talking about their 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 special topics. And um, for the first webinar, we had a turnout of around two thousand five hundred people, and mo they were mostly medical students. So I mean, wow. this sh this goes to show how interested people are. And now we have three, I think, I believe it's three universities in Germany where people can actually choose this as a topic. Um, uh, they can choose nutrition as a topic. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, unfortunately, it's not um, in, in the main cur curriculum, but they can, so it, well, like when you study medicine in Germany, there are um, like these sidetracks that you can do. So you basically have to choose from, let's say, five different topics. They could be uh, let's say um, ac acute medicine, or it could be w whatever it is, and then there's also now there's also nutrition at least at in, in, at three universities in Germany, and that's thanks to all of the work that um, that the Penn University groups are doing. Um, so this is something, you know, you have to put in the energy to to 
um, to to make uh, to make it accessible for people. But once it's accessible, people are all over it. Like people people want to know about this. People want to know about nutrition. Medical students are, as you said, super thirsty for this information. And I think this turnout at I don't know how, how many people uh, were there at the second event. I, I guess there were there were many people as as well. Again. But 2,500 medical students at one event, I don't, I, I've never seen this happen before. So I think this is, um, this is a precedent that goes to show where, where we can go with this. Um, yeah. This is my inspiration. You are my inspiration. This is where I want to get to. I think it's going to be a game changer. If, if we get to the academy exactly the same as you're doing, hmm. I think if, if it's a part of the, of the study, uh, of the... Um, um, of the academy, mm -hmm. then it's, it, it gets the weight that it should get. I, I mm -hmm. think it's going to be, it, it's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, I still, we didn't find a way yet, but um, I, I, this is where we want to go. As you mentioned before as well, I thought that this is really funny. When you, when you, when you give these webinars, like before, before Corona hit and be, when we were still able to do seminars like in, in, in person, we always at each seminar we had one or two maybe three people who were interested in joining and then we did 10 20 seminars and then we had 30 40 new people who actually joined pan and who wanted to wanted to come along on the ride um so uh, yeah that's that's basically the, the way it has it has worked for for pan international and then um that's that's the way we can grow and i th i mean people just have to as 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 i mentioned before people i think just have to hear the word yeah. Um, that they're now able to, ah, okay, there is this organization, I can join them. The, our, people are already doing something. I don't have to put in all this, this activation energy myself. People have already put in something or at least people come together in order to do it. Um, I think the, the aspect of not being alone with this is really, is really crucial. Uh, that's, that's very important, yeah. It's, uh, yeah yesterday I gave a webinar, uh, the recurrent one that, that you've mentioned. Yeah. Um, at the end of the webinar, um, a participant wrote in the chat, um, I'm a med, a med school student, and it's mind-blowing that uh, we have this information, you have this information. It's lovely to hear that it's uh, supported by evidence-based uh, articles, and what we already know is supported by evidence, mm -hmm. and um, it, it should be a part of our school, of mm -hmm. our med school. So it's, it's a very common uh, feedback that I get. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy to hear this. And I am a, um, a very strong supporter of this, of this mission. We, like one of, the, one of the reasons that I, one of, my, one of my goals is that at least every medical student has heard this information once in, in, her, in his or her medical um, career. Like you have to hear this information as a medical student because once you hear this, once you hear that, for example, Dean Ornish was able to reverse coronary artery disease by lifestyle intervention, you never forget this. Yeah. Once you see that, once you see the, um, the the pictures of the of the coronary arteries that are that are full of plaque, and then you see them after an intervention that are and then they're free of plaque, you go like, okay, this this I, I didn't learn this at medical school. Why don't I learn this at medical school? And um, uh, we we learn m many many great things at medical school, but the the preventive aspect. Um, and also the therapeutical aspect of nutrition, like we have, I mean, we, we, we have to get this in there. And I think we're in a very, very good way. And internationally as well, which I'm like, I couldn't have, I couldn't have imagined this in my wildest dreams, f maybe four years ago, there was something that, that I was interested in. I thought, okay, maybe there are two or three other people who are interested, but now we can see that's not the case. <laughs> there are so many people interested and there are so many passionate yeah. people. And um, yeah, that's, it's, it's just awesome. Yeah. And if we know it, like if physicians know it, they can address their patients with it and the patient can decide if he wants to give it a chance. Uh, if we don't talk about it, then it's not going to happen. But if we do talk about it, many patients would say, I want to try. Talking about the um, Israeli uh, Medical Association that, already, that also got on board. Um, it, is is nutrition something that's because I know that there is a there's a big plant based movement in Israel, and I think I heard that there there are more plant based eaters in Israel per capita than in any any other country in the world. I don't know whether that's true, but I um as far as I know, there are ma many people who who eat a plant based diet in in Israel. Is 
is um, nutrition generally, do you, do you feel nutrition is generally a bigger topic in Israel? Do you think people are generally more health oriented um, or more oriented towards healthy nutrition? It's a very interesting question and uh, a lot of aspects to it. Hmm. Um, one thing that we have is um, our guidelines are um, related to the Mediterranean diet. So this is very helpful mm -hmm. because as, as we've said earlier, the Mediterranean diet is basically uh, one of the patterns that is um, plant-based. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one topic. I think uh, we don't have formal information regarding the percentage of people that stick to whole food plant-based diet. It, it is, we don't have it, but it feels like it's a very big issue here and the movement even. Um, regarding the last uh, period that we're experiencing, unfortunately, regarding the pandemic, I think it really raises the topic of preventing um, diseases, like chronic diseases. It emphasizes um, the importance of not getting sick with I mean, diabetes, uh, atherosclerosis, etc., cetera, uh, which, um, makes greater risk in, in, in Corona, for example. And the other thing is, um, I think it, it's also uh, related to environment and uh, economics. It's being able to grow your own food. Uh, it's like being independent and not rely on import, importing uh, food. It's, it's a very large topic, but I think it, it starts to get um, more aware to how we can sustain ourselves by growing food. And um, I think it's another like a kick to the uh, plant-based diet. Like the climate, I guess, is, is, is different, for example, to the climate in Germany, where we can grow apples, we can grow carrots, and we can grow potatoes and stuff like that. But I think as, as just that I've, I've never been to Israel, unfortunately, but um, th just in my mind, I guess you're in a position where, as, as you touched on, you can actually grow quite a lot of food in, in yeah. Israel. You can grow vegetables and, and fruit um, yeah. and nuts it's, as well. I mean, which it, is something, yeah. Yes, and it's, it's kind of a big value here. Okay. If, okay. if, you're, yeah. if you're able to grow your food, like um, many years ago, we, we were very proud of our oranges. We have one of um, um, uh, brands of oranges that is, is very famous around the world. Mm -hmm. Being able to grow your fruits and vegetables is, is a big issue. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, as I said before, it's, a, it's even a value. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it, it's, it's a very risky um, business okay. it, being in agriculture. It's, it's not easy, but it is very appreciated here in Israel to be a farmer. So maybe it has um, um, influence on what you said. And actually we do have in our culture, in our, uh, we have uh, uh, different kinds of, of cultures in Israel. Uh, a lot of them give uh, vegetables a very big place on the plate. Mm, okay. Many dishes uh, are um, containing a lot of legumes and vegetables and grains and um, may maybe it also has a part in, in eating healthy and being interested in, in eating healthy. That's interesting. I mean, when I think of, for example, Israeli uh, dishes, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is hummus, which which I just <laughs> love. I mean, I love hummus. That I I could eat hummus all day long with with vegetables or with bread. Or I mean, it's 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 so delicious. And th th I mean, it's, it's a legume. You know, nobody would yeah. think. Ah, I don't really want to eat chickpeas, but when you give someone, when you present someone with hummus, everyone goes like completely crazy and they want to eat this stuff. I've never met anyone who doesn't like it. Um, so, I mean, there, I guess there are people, but people that I hang out with, they usually like it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's something I'm, I'm now thinking about, tra you know, traditional cooking because yeah. what, what's been happening in Germany, um, and I'd be interested in, in your point of view, um, what's been happening in Israel during the last, I mean, I'm, I'm 31, so I can only look back at the last, let's say 20 years or something. But what I've realized is that home cooking goes down by quite a bit, right? People eat outside. Um, people go to takeouts. A lot of the, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the um, uh, fast food fast food companies uh, came over from from overseas, 
and yeah. we now have a lot of of you know I don't want to name want want to name names, but um, there, I mean every everyone is aware <laughs> what these what these big companies are. So I mean it's the the ultra processed food and the takeaway food that has just uh, replaced a lot of the traditional home cooking. Interestingly, when you look at traditional German cuisine, I mean it's sometimes very heavy and it's 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 you know it's just very heavy fatty food. But we do have legumes, for example. There are quite a lot of um, dishes, traditional dishes, with lentils, but we don't cook them any longer because and, and now these these ultra processed foods and these uh, fast food f f these fast food companies they for example legumes is a good is a good example. They just don't have them. They have they're just basically non-existent. Uh, in people's diets, and I'd be interested about this this process in Israel. Is is um, as you mentioned, for example, being proud about being a farmer. Yeah. That's something that that changes your your perspective on things, right? But, uh, unfortunately, we experience the same trend that you've talked about, uh, going from home cooking and traditional cooking to eating out, uh, with the big companies that are on every corner of the street. Uh, we do feel it and we do see it in, in the outcomes of uh, the raising diabetes uh, percentage, unfortunately, in Israel. And maybe this is a counter movement in, in this field because in the last 20, 30 years, we see a, a frightening raise of uh, chronic disease. And maybe it's because we eat so, many, uh, pro so much processed food and maybe the counter movement is, is cooking more at home, eating more healthily, because we do have now the knowledge that we cannot treat chronic diseases. The best way to deal with them is to prevent them. Mm -hmm. You can manage them after you unfortunately get it, but you, the best way is to prevent it. I think that we are now in the mindset that preventing those diseases is the most beneficial way um, both uh, health, I mean, both in, in the person's perspective and the, um, the nation perspective. Um, I'm not saying we, we're there already, but we're starting to get it. So maybe um, eating more at home. And again, in the last months, we experienced uh, being more at home. So we have to cook more at home. Um, maybe we should also look at it as a chance mm. as an opportunity to get to know our traditional foods and get to brush our skills in, in cooking more healthfully. Um, so I hope it will just give us the alarm um, that we need to, to go back to cooking um, simply, healthfully, using more legumes. I think it's, it's one of the best of uh, foods that you get, um, how do you say, um, good, good value for money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's both nutritional and not expensive. So I really emphasize that in my webinar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I really like the notion that you just, um, that you just uh, created that we get back to basically back to, to a traditional value when it comes to cooking cooking at home, eating together, not eating while you're sitting in front of your computer. I mean, these are all, I mean, it's, I know that it's much more, e it's easy said and not, and not that, that easily done. Um, but this is something that w I think we should have, or we, it, it would be good for us if we created a little bit more awareness when it comes to this. Uh, there's on the one hand what we eat, yes, but on the other hand, how we eat. And I think the way we, we did it maybe 100, 150 years ago, was definitely much more sustainable environmentally and it was also more nutritious and more uh, more sustainably when it comes to the human body um, and i think legumes that's also what, one of the th examples that i always i always come back to because they're so cheap they're yeah. so cheap you can store them for forever um and once you know how to cook them it's not actually a big deal to cook them you can even get a pressure cooker and you can cook them within a very short time um, uh, you can soak them overnight, so it's it's once you, once you get the drill, um, it's super easy to do it, and and you can. There are so many varieties as well. It's not that there's only chickpeas. I mean, there are many different yeah. lentils. There are many different beans. There are even different chickpeas. I, I just realized a couple of months ago that there's there are black chickpeas, which I find really cool. <laughs> wow! No, I really want to try black chickpeas. 
Um, so I think, yeah, I think legumes, people should really, should really try them out. And, and uh, yeah, and, and then if you don't know what to do with them, go back to, to, to the traditional recipes, right? Have a look at what your grandmother used to do with them and then you find out what, what great things um, are possible. Yeah. That's what I do. I like making my grandmother's food. Yeah. Lots so of you, legumes, yeah. You, 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 you touched on, or you said the word alarm. And when I, when I, the situation that we're currently in, I think is quite alarming. I mean, there's, there's turmoil all over the, all over the world. I guess that's, that's, it's been that way for a long time, but it's very visible to me at least um, during the last months, especially with the Corona pandemic. And then there are these, uh, we, we touched on that in, in the Power of Nutrition webinar as well, the, these 10 global health threats that the WHO talks about. Um, I'll just quickly, I'll just quickly say the first five again, it's air pollution and climate change, non-communicable diseases, the global influenza pandemic. So now it's, that was from 2019. So the, the WHO at the time, there was no Corona outbreak or there hadn't been the Corona outbreak. Then there's fragile and, and vulnerable settings, which I guess is just something, for example, drought leads to, leads to those settings. And then there's antimicrobial resistance. Now, when we look at all these, all these, topics we can influence all of them with nutrition we, we know that this is possible we know that we can influence climate change by eating more plant-based foods we know that we can influence non-communicable diseases by doing that antimicrobial resistances as well and now we know that the the um i mean it's it's, it's been obvious for a quite a long quite a long time that pandemics uh, will occur due to the way that that we treat uh, livestock um so nutrition plays a huge part now what i'm interested in that's the one thing we, we, we know this, but knowledge doesn't lead to action. <laughs> so yeah, with your, with your background of, of getting people to or getting people into a situation where they can actually do things where they, where they're, where you empower people so much that they can change their habits, they can change their behavior and they can, um, they can actually make a difference because knowing things oftentimes, at least when I think about these things, I sometimes feel overwhelmed. Like I feel, okay, this is an, an insane situation that we're in. What are we, go what are we going to do to improve this? Um, and I would really love, love to know what you think about with, with your experience, with your work experience, and also just with, with your perspective on this. Um, what, what can we do? Like what would be si si um, um, simple steps that we could take in order to, to move forward in a, in a healthy trajectory? Well, it's a very inspirational question and a very difficult one. Mm. If, if I had the, the answer, I would be um, very lucky. Um, I, I, from what you've said, I've just uh, remembered that the name of my webinar um, is the solution is right under our noses, mm. meaning it's right here and it's right in our mouth. I mean, literally under our noses because what we eat influences the whole planet. And uh, I think um, what we realize, uh, you asked about Israel, and that sustainability is, is as important as health, and it goes hand in hand. If we can do something in a sustainable way, uh, this is the right path to take. And what we're doing now is, is not sustainable, as we know. Um, we have all these uh, documentaries and all this uh, scientific data that we do need to change our ways. Uh, like the Eat Lancet report is telling us what we need to change, to change in order to uh, be in our uh, planetary boundaries. So I think we know what we need to do. We just need to um, get in line, get together and do it. I mean, this does involve what we've said earlier um, top bottom job, like uh, getting to the most influential organizations and um, making it to change the whole system. And we're trying um, bottom up way and top bottom. And I believe it's it's the right. It's the two. It's not parallel because they're um, complementary uh, paths. And hopefully we can, um, with all the data we have, we can influence the um, uh, decision makers to take us to a better path, which is environmentally and health and sustainability 
and just do what we, we already have the information. Mm -hmm. We need to take action. We need to make decisions and follow them. Mm -hmm. And we do need um, to cooperate more plant-based foods on our plate. Mm -hmm. And we need to uh, do all the supportive measurements to do so for our farmers, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, it, I think it's a large global effort. Mm -hmm. And one of the things PAN is doing these days, PAN International and a few other organizations, uh, to influence the guidelines of several um, states. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the paths that might help us do what you've mentioned. Yeah. I, I, well, thank you, thank you so much for, 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 for this answer. I think the, um, I really like the idea of the answer. We already have the answer. We don't have to. We don't have to do a soul search in order to find out what's what's inside us and what. We, like we we know what to do, um, and I really like the notion of it's right under our noses. Like to have this because this is empowering. I think this is really empowering when you know that you can actually change something about the situation that you're in. I mean that's something that we know in psychology, for example, it's self actualization when you can actually do something. You, you can actually you can actually change something. You can actually be an efficient part yeah. of your own life, um, and you're not uh, you're not left um, you're not left alone. You're like you're not stranded on the beach, and you um, you're, you're not you're not you're not um, yeah you're not a victim of your of your surroundings basically. But you can take action. You can change things. And I really like the idea of it's right under your nose. That's that's awesome. That's really <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. I think we have the power. We have the power to change. We have the power to influence uh, both everyone in his, in his own home, in his own plate, and, and in uh, systems. So I, I think we're striving to do both uh, paths. You've helped me out with this before. The, we, we, had a, we had a little, um, we asked people on Instagram and on Facebook for questions to yeah. send them in. For for to, to for for you for for me to ask them to ask you the, those questions, yes. which I think is a really which I think is a really fun uh, fun way to to get this more interactive. Now we're not in the situation where we can, where we can do seminars live, unfortunately, and in those situations we can always have lively conversations. But I think this might be a good substitute, uh, so that people can send us uh, questions directly that 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 uh, we can then ask them. Um, we can uh, we can ask our guests. I so love let's, this let's idea. Just, yeah. yeah, really cool. Yeah. So, so let's, um, let's just start by doing that. So I'll just, there are four questions. And the first question is, what do you think would help physicians to accept a plant-based diet as a legitimate diet and recommend it to their patient, patients? So basically, I guess that's the, the underlying notion is that physicians usually don't, they think that plant-based diets don't work or they, they think that they might be dangerous. So what can we do in order to, to, help, uh, to help physicians to accept those, those plant-based diets? So I do believe this is what we've mentioned before, like um, doing our seminars, bringing the information uh, to the front. So we do have this, this data, we do have articles. Uh, you've mentioned Dean Olnish, we have uh, Dr. Esselstein, we have Neil Bernard, uh, we have different kinds of scientists that already uh, took this path and, and tried these trials. And we do see amazing uh, outcomes. So I believe that um, showing these articles, showing these researchers um, plays a key role in, in knowing that it's, it's healthy and we have a position statements of the um, AMD, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think knowledge is powerful. So this is what I would say to this question. Great. No way. Yeah. So the next question is something that we talked about as well, um, but not that, that concretely. What are the best ways to include lentils in your diet? I think that's something that's very <laughs> actionable. So <laughs> what, what, what could you recommend? Well, lentils is, is a, a, big, a big love in my life. So uh, as you've mentioned, we have different kinds of lentils. Um, in Israel, we have a very uh, popular dish called mejadara. Mejadara is rice with lentils inside. Uh, I do it... Uh, on, on a, a weekly basis. Um, when I cook rice, it's never rice by itself. It, it always involves lentils inside. 
I consider them as rice. Like if I put on, on, on one glass the rice, I put some of it lentils, and then I consider it as rice, like in, in water uh, proportion, I mean. Mm -hmm. And then you get the lentils in. Mm -hmm. And I, an, another advice that I can give, and I think it also answers uh, his next question, um, with a snack to go or something like that. Yeah, there was one question about snacks. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. It's kind of an omelet. Um, it's uh, like a pancake maybe, but salty one. Using lentil flour. Uh, oh, okay. do, do you have it in Germany? Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. becoming very popular. It's becoming popular. Well. Yeah, yeah. Here as well. And yeah. mixing it with water and adding some spices, herbs, or uh, grounded uh, zucchini or mushrooms or whatever you like and putting it on a pan, mm -hmm. it's uh, getting into a lovely omelet. And I think it's a very easy way to, um, to put lentils in your, in your diet. Mm -hmm. um, one last advice that I have is to uh, sprout them. Oh, yeah. Like soak and sprout and then put it wherever you like in your salad. It, it's just so lovely to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. That, those, this is good advice, yeah. It, especially when it comes to the lentil flour. I think there's so much that you can do with, with lentil flour as well. And there's one thing, I don't know whether, whether that's getting more and more popular in Israel as well, but here we, all of a sudden we have like lentil pasta. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Also, that's, also. Exactly. That's also a really cool way to do it. I, I know that, that Niklas from, from Pan International, he, he once told me that his daughter, he, she, she loves eating pasta. And, uh, but she doesn't realize whether it's grain pasta or whether it's whole grain or whether it's lentil pasta. It just has <laughs> the shape of pasta. Uh -huh. so that might be, my, I thought that was a really good um, advice for parents also who would like to, uh, to get some, uh, some legumes into their children's diet. Great um, maybe, advice. maybe their, their children like to uh, enjoy to yeah. eat. Um, and lentil. also put some on a soup. Huh. In the soup, the lentils, they kind of dissolve and make it thick and very rich. So another cool way to uh, put them in, in our foods. That's great, yeah. So then the, the last audience question, uh, so to speak, is what is the biggest challenge in working with physicians surrounding healthy lifestyle issues? Yeah, I think we, we touched on this at the beginning, but yeah. this, is, this is very concrete about the, um, uh, the, the biggest challenges uh, that you have with yeah. physicians, yeah. Yeah, we did talk about the limited time we have yeah. with the patient. I hear it a lot. Um, it's understandable, but I do believe when we when we grasp the um, the big weight, the big influence that nutrition has, we can incorporate it in our short uh, talk with the patient. I, I I keep telling physicians, I think your word uh, is, is gold. Mm. It's what each word you say to a patient is it's something he's it's like uh, something you sowed uh, in, in, in like a plant is starting to grow when you when you say it so even if it's very brief even if it's just one question I think the patient goes home and and maybe it will it will affect maybe just in the next meeting you will uh, crack it but it's it's crucial that physicians uh, do incorporate it in their in their treatment Oh, that's 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 um, I, I really love I really love the, um, the, the, the what you touched on at the at the end. I think it's so important that physicians understand. I mean, for some reason, which I think is historical, people of like as you said, the, the word of the physician might might be gold or whatever you will, however however you want to put it. But people they just remember what their physicians tell them. And sometimes I talk to patients and they, they tell me, I ask them where they got the information from. And then they say, well, 30 years ago, a doctor told me this. And I go like, how, like, how did you, re how do you remember, how do you even remember this? Um, but yeah, I, I guess because, yeah, it, it seems to be very important to people what physicians say. And because of, because of that, I think as medical students, as physicians, as physicians as well, we should be aware of that. We should be aware that our, our word apparently is very, can be powerful. And I think we have to, yeah, we just have to be aware of that. And we, and we, and we need to, we need to um, at, that, at that point, realize that, that um, I think that's a movie quote, right? Isn't that from Spider-Man? With great power comes great responsibility. Great responsibility. That's yeah. just something that came to my mind. I think we have to be aware of that. And especially when it comes to nutrition, 
we also have to be aware that we, because what, I mean, what mostly physicians that I hear when they don't know anything about nutrition, they tell their patients, well, eat everything, but not too much of, of so not too much of one thing. And I go like, okay, this, it, it's not really bad advice, but it's not really actionable. I mean, what does that mean? So I think we have to, yeah, I think we have to be aware of this. We have to have something um, ready to tell patients. Uh, we have to have this information sorted in our minds um, so that we can help people. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a great, that's great advice that you gave there, that, uh, that we have to know, we have to realize this, how important it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so at the end I have... I thought that this would that this might be a um, a, f a fun uh, a fun at the end. So I have five five really like these quick fire questions, where you don't really think about it. You just you just okay. uh, tell fire me the answer. The let's yes. let's see how let's see how we go. Okay, what what was the last thing that you ate? Uh, toast with homemade um, almond uh, spread. All right, very like nice. Feta like cheese. Okay, I, I have. I've I have made. I haven't eaten anything. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> if, you, if you could only eat one dish for the rest of your life, what would it be? Wow. Uh, hummus. Okay. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> it's hummus. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> With pizza. With pizza. Okay. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So, and what is your, what is, who is your favorite plant-based quote unquote celebrity? So people who are, who are well known in the, in the plant-based um, world. Do you have a do you have a person that you that you enjoy listening to most or that you um, enjoy following most? I really really love I, I love scientists. Mm. Uh, I, I I admire their work. Um, but in the um, in the field of of giving lectures of speakers, I I really look up to Dr. Michael Greger. I think his skills in, in giving lectures is something I, I would love to have uh, a small percentage of. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, yeah he's, he's very funny. Yeah, he's, just, <laughs> he's just a very, very lively person. That's incredible, yeah. Um, okay, for you personally, what's important uh, to stay healthy? What, what, do, what do you do to stay healthy? I do a lot, but the first, you, you said the first thing that comes in mind. Right, exactly. Right. Um, um, it's, it's a mental uh, part. It's um, trying to uh, look at the good parts, at the good things, at the, what you say, the half full, the, the glass half full. The glass is half full, yeah. Um, but I do wrap it with uh, a good sleep, um, trying to get more exercise, walking. I, I walked in the park this morning before our talk, so it was so fulfilling. So um, optimism. Uh, I would say. That's great. That's great. And and the last quick fire question: What what book uh, on nutrition and health would you recommend? Yeah, it's a difficult one. But since I I, I forgot to mention in in, in the previous question that um, cooking is one of the things that I do um, to stay healthy, mm -hmm. uh, maybe I would recommend a cooking book. Mm. Not reading a book, but uh, trying cooking. Not mm -hmm. maybe it's not even a book. Maybe it's recipes from online. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's what I do when I want to cook something that I don't know yet. I, I just take uh, inspiration from some recipes and just making the recipe I want. It's only because I don't have a name of a book now. But I, I do recommend trying cooking at home. It's uh, it's magnificent. What fuels you? Like what what with all the things that you're doing with with the with the work that you did at the hospital, with the work that you that, that you were doing in the in the communities now, with the work that you're doing with Pan, what what motivates you? What gets you in the, out of bed in the morning? What is the sort of the driving force behind 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 the things that you're doing? I think supporting people um, to live healthily. It's it's so fulfilling. It's it's the it's the best feedback I can get. I mean. Um, when, when people change their perspective and their action, speaking of action, I cook more healthy, I use more uh, legumes, I, my, my children eat more vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. And, and my, my favorite feedback when I speak to physicians, um, it's about time. Mm -hmm. It's about time this organization um, gives us, gives nutrition the proper uh, place uh, we can just make lives better. Mm -hmm. So 
I think this is this is the fuel, um, the knowledge, the practice, and and people are happy to adopt uh, simple and healthy habits. As as you said, um, you can you can go f very qu when you're on your own, you can go very quickly. And when you're together with others, and when you support each other, and when you when you look out for others' health, for example, uh, you can get far. And yep. I think that's uh, that's that's cool. that's what we're here for. Yeah, Ronnie, thank you, thank you so much um, for for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Everything that I mean, just you know, that you're telling me about it, and and that you that you take the time to. Um, yeah, to, to be here and, and uh, talk about the wonderful things that you're doing. My um, pleasure. If, if people want to get connected with, with you and with Pan Israel, um, what's the best way they can do that? We have on our website all the, um, all the data and how to approach us, how to register. Pan-il.org, uh, yeah. right? That's, that's yeah. your website? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, we'll, we will link it down below uh, okay. below the video so that people can connect get, get connected with you. All right, Ronnie, thanks so much. And, Thank you, um, Silas. Maybe we, maybe we can do it again and maybe we can talk about the, the motivational interview and the communication part because that's some, something that I'm really interested in too, but that's something for a new podcast. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Silas. Thanks again. It was Bye. lovely. All right. Now, I am super happy to have had this conversation with Ronnie. And I think the wisdom that Ronnie can offer is incredibly valuable in our time. She's able to combine her knowledge and information about nutritional sciences with her expertise and all of her experience in working together with people who are in need of change and actually enable that change in the real world. I'm sure that Ronnie and I will catch up again in the future, but in the meantime, if you want to learn more about Pan Israel, you can do so at pan-il.org, where you find all the great resources that we talked about and, of course, the information you need about their upcoming webinars. And talking about webinars, I also encourage you to check out Pan International at pan-int.org, that's pan-int.org. We've got great webinars coming up for you as well, uh, both in English and German throughout the winter season. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date and check out our social media channels at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. And make sure to tune in again next time at the PAN Podcast.